My guest today is Steven Pinker, the psychologist and best-selling author who's emerged over the past two decades as one of the leading defenders of academic freedom and liberal values of limited government, secularism, tolerance, and free enterprise. A year ago, we helped found the Council on Academic Freedom at Harvard, a faculty organization to advocate for the free and civil exchange of ideas inside and outside the classroom. In the wake of the reaction by the campus left to the October 7th Hamas attacks on Israel, he published a five-point plan to save Harvard from itself. We talk about whether higher education is doomed, why so many people on the right and left are skeptical about moral and material progress, and how his photography fits into his larger intellectual worldview. Here is The Reason Interview with Steven Pinker. Last December, you published an op-ed titled A Five-Point Plan to Save Harvard from Itself in the Boston Globe. You wrote that Harvard is now the place where using the wrong pronoun is a hanging offense, but calling for another Holocaust depends on context, and that deplorable speech should be refuted, not criminalized, but you also noted that outlawing hate speech would only result in students calling anything they didn't want to hear hate speech. Can you bring us up to date on the climate at Harvard. And you know, we'll go from Harvard to a larger academic setting, but how are things going there? Is you know, it seems as if free speech was embraced by the former president of Harvard uh, and by many people in the institution, but is it a real commitment to free speech and it, you know, intellectual seriousness? Yeah, it, it, well, Harvard's a big place and there is a, a diversity of, of opinion. In uh, co-founding the Council on Academic Freedom at Harvard, we, there was a, a, a rush of faculty joining us, but still a small percentage of, of the faculty. Many of them vocal, many of them for the first time had an opportunity to just communicate with themselves across the sprawling uh, uh, multiple campuses at Harvard. Uh, many are, are uh, upset at the direction that Harvard and other elite universities have taken in um, uh, restricting the range of expressible opinions to a pretty narrow slice of the spectrum, to criminalizing certain opinions, to uh, getting into needless trouble by taking um, by a university taking stands that really should be the prerogative of its students and faculty. That there isn't any reason that a university should have a foreign policy or should. Uh, uh, and um, and in, in general, at the level of discourse, where uh, just calling someone a racist is considered a uh, you know a, a, a counter argument or, or a refutation, so we uh, formed this uh, this council to try to push back, to try to offer emotional support to those who are under attack, because it can be devastating to be the the, the target of a cancellation campaign, to also be a constituency that would. Uh, while activists are yelling into an administrator's ear, and, and a lot of the problems that universities have faced have come from the fact that deans and provosts and presidents just want to make trouble go away. And so if someone is yelling at them and making their life miserable, they'll do whatever it takes to get them to shut up. So we figure if we also yell at them, then they'll actually have to think about what's the optimal thing to do rather than just do what makes the, the noise go down. Um, do you feel like it's having, I mean, that this time it's different, that this time it's different. There have been flare-ups in the past, but it seems like the outrage over the response to, you know, I mean, it was really the congressional hearing about the uh, college responses to the attacks by Hamas on Israel. Um, you know, is it different this time? I, I, I think so. There, that, uh, I mean, Harvard itself and uh, is... You know, it is in a, 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 a kind of crisis by its own standards, uh, which is to say that donations are down. And so <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't uh, really need the money, but it wants the money, right? It, yes. Yeah. Uh, and it, um, and uh, applications are down. Uh, it's uh, become a national joke. I have a collection of memes and headlines and bumper stickers, like the bumper sticker, my son didn't get into Harvard. Um, a, a, a editorial cartoon of a, uh, a corporate guy saying this guy has a stellar resume, straight A's, top scores, didn't go to Harvard. 
Um, so the, the, the reputation, which is something that, which is a, a huge uh, resource that Harvard has drawn on, um, uh, is, uh, is threatened. And when it's threatened, a lot of Harvard's comparative advantage uh, will also be threatened. Now, Harvard has a lot of money, but it also can, to some extent, coast on its reputation. And it, it can only go down, right? I mean, for the longest time, it was... <laughs> and and, and uh, at least if the past few months are an indication, it is. And um, you, I mean, you also pointed out in that Boston Globe piece uh, and elsewhere that it wasn't just that. I mean, the, uh, the affirmative action case uh, that Harvard lost... Did, does that play into the sense that, okay, like Harvard been, has been moving in the wrong direction for a long period of time and needs to kind of back up and get back on the highway? Um, yeah, it did. Uh, it, it certainly got uh, Harvard's attention. And the, the fact that it is, it does have an outsized reputation means that it, it has a, a certain cushion that it doesn't necessarily, not every department has to compete to be the best in the, in the country because... People, students will come, graduate students will come, donors will give. Um, and so there so can you're be... saying that, like, psychology doesn't really have to work very hard at all, <laughs> right? It's like... Well, it... Uh, I mean, psych psychology has gone through through waves, and my my former colleague Steve Costlin is here, who made it, the I think, the best department in the country when he was a chair and working behind the scenes, which is one of the reasons that I decamped MIT for Harvard uh, almost 20... Well, more than 20 years ago. But the actual quality of departments can go up and down, and but Harvard has a certain buffer right. because of its reputation, which is now, uh, now now being threatened. And a lot of the things that we're proposing would actually, uh, we like we meaning the Council on Academic Freedom, would actually take some uh, leave some headaches on the administration itself, even though their prime. Uh, driver is to avoid bad bad publicity, keep the, uh, the donations going. But a lot of the trouble, especially that our former president, Claudine Gay, found herself in, could have been avoided if Harvard did have a more robust uh, academic freedom policy. Uh, among other things... What, if, do you, what do you mean by that? That well, plagiarism would have been allowed under a more well, robust <laughs> academic freedom? I, I, and I, I, I'm joking, but... You, in, in the op-ed uh, that you had written, you said you didn't think that it was a hanging offense, uh, Gay's appearance in the, uh, and response in the congressional hearing. Uh, that was before the plagiarism stuff yes, came out. Yes, is, is that is that is the plagiarism, was that a legitimate firing offense, or is that kind of a side issue? Uh, for me, it was a side issue, okay. and, I, and I think yeah. I just won't, won't go there, because yeah, sure. it's a, I mean, that was her, she was, her testimony did not differ from the other two. Right. Uh, elite university and only presidents. one is left, right? The yes, MIT president. Liz McGill yeah. left even before, and Sally Kornbluth is still the president of MIT, although also under fire. Um, but I, th I think focusing on Claudine Gay was a bit of a, dis uh, of a distraction because the problems are more, as we say, right. systemic. Yeah. Uh, but among them are the fact that universities feel that they have to, uh, uh, universities and their divisions, that they have to offer moral guidance, some sort of you know, pastoral counseling to a grateful nation, what they ought to feel in response to various tragedies right. and, and outrages. And it inevitably gets them into trouble mm -hmm. because someone will think they haven't, uh, it was too early, it was too late, it was too strong, it was, it, yeah. they, it was, only one side was represented, they were too, uh, on the other hand. So if they just could shut up and point to a policy that said, we have to shut up, we don't comment, as the University of Chicago has done mm -hmm. for more than 50 years, it would just get them off the hook. They don't have to comment on Ukraine. So that's the institutional George neutrality. Institutional and, neutrality. And, and Chicago it does it sticks by that pretty well. Pretty well. That is, if a department or a center puts up a statement, then they're under pressure to, to take it down. Mm -hmm. And the reason that it's relevant to academic freedom is that it's just prejudicial to the people working in the university or in, in particular in the departments. If your department chair is posting some opinion on police shootings or, or, or Palestine or uh, Ukraine. Or Donald Trump, I'm sure or, that or happens even Donald a lot. Trump. Yeah, yeah I, then... we love Trump. I love Trump. My department loves Trump, right, all the time. <laughs> all the time, yes. But it, it is prejudicial to the faculty and the students yeah. who have to worry, are my, are my professional prospects mm -hmm. at stake if I take a position that differs from the official one on my department yeah. uh, website? Would you, in, in your world of institution and neutrality, would individual faculty be free yeah. to issue oh, yeah. and students and everything? Right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's just that the institution yeah. itself should be the 
should be the arena. It should be the debating right. club. It shouldn't uh, actually be a debater. Right. Um, and uh, that leads into one of the other uh, of the five principles. The next one after institutional neutrality was nonviolence. Um, which seems insane, right? That you have to say, you know, the colleges should be mostly nonviolent places. But <laughs> what, you know, how, do, how does that fit in? Yeah, it's, um, again, I think we'd be actually saving the university from themselves. But the idea that a, a legitimate form of expression of opinion in a university campus should be forcibly ejecting a dean from his office and occupying the building, uh, you know, that just shouldn't be what a university is about. Now, I think a lot of faculty have a certain nostalgia for when they did it in the, in the 60s to protest Vietnam. And it's like, isn't it cute, the younger generation's doing the same thing? But it really isn't okay uh, for a number of reasons. It, it, it's a commitment to the wrong ideals. The ideal of the university ought to be persuasion, the careful formation of arguments, not chanting slogans over bullhorns and and getting in other students' so faces. So nonviolence includes shouting down, like drowning out speakers. It's one thing to protest. It's another thing to preclude somebody from speaking. Exactly. That is, there should not be a heckler's veto. Mm -hmm. That is, protest obviously is protected, mm -hmm. and protest could involve holding placards. It could, involve, it could include you know, shouting out, you lie in the middle of a lecture, but it can't involve uh, forcing speakers off the stage, drowning them out, uh, drawing a banner across the stage so that speakers can't see them. That is restricting other speech as a, uh, an ostensible form of Do expression of your own. Do you feel like, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, the kind of response that came after, the, you know, and most of the stuff was touched up by the October 7th attacks, but do you feel like students and faculty kind of at Harvard or elsewhere like kind of understand this isn't simply hypothetical, that, you know, nonviolence is actually a principle that we need to kind of hold to? Uh, surprisingly, we've had to make the case, or some, some of us have, that, um, that, is that it's not okay to invade a classroom and start chanting slogans over bullhorns. Yeah. Um, but we had to make that case, that case and that the university should be consistent in cracking down on it. Again, to protect itself, such as the lawsuit filed by the uh, students against anti-Semitism, who uh, have pointed to uh, episodes in which Jewish students have been uh, intimidated, have been um, uh, blocked, in one case were assaulted. Mm -hmm. And if the university just had a policy that speech is, you know, is fine, it's okay, we encourage it, but physical force is not, and, and acted consistently, then they would be kind of off the hook for right. uh, kind of selective uh, enforcement. And in fact, the, uh, you know, now if they started to enforce it against the often quite um, disruptive Palestinian student groups, then the Palestinian students groups could file a lawsuit saying, well, how come they're enforcing it against us and they don't enforce it against other groups? And if it was just clear, this is the policy, this is what we're, we're this is what we recognize as speech, this is what we recognize as force, uh, and be consistent, it would remove a headache from And do you think them. the uh, bookstore should stop selling Harvard branded bullhorns? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like... Uh, it's well, always amazing, right? Where, where do amazing. these bullhorns come? I guess Amazon will deliver anything you know, in a couple <laughs> no of hours, right? Well, and also just the, the, the first of the, the point of the five-point plan was just a consistent commitment to uh, academic freedom. Because yeah. another reason that Claudine Gay got into such trouble is that when she was given what admittedly was a, a, a kind of a trap that she walked into... Yeah. That is, if students called for genocide against Jews, would that be prohibited by Harvard's code of conduct? Um, and she made a pretty hardcore ACLU-style free speech argument, which came across as you know, hollow or worse, because you know we, we've had uh, a, a lecturer who was kind of driven out of Harvard for saying there are two sexes. Mm -hmm. We've had a uh, professor whose course. Well, there was, are only two sexes. <laughs> yeah, only right, two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There are only two sexes. That there's a uh, another professor whose course was canceled because he wanted to apply to explore how counterinsurgency techniques could be used against gang warfare. Mm -hmm. We had a, a professor in the School of Public Health who, someone doing some offense archaeology, uh, uh, uncovered the fact that he had co-signed an amicus brief for the Obergefell Supreme mm -hmm. Court case. Uh, against uh, a national policy 
um, uh, allowing gay marriage. Mm -hmm. There were calls for his tenure to be revoked, for his classes to be boycotted. He had to undergo uh, you know, struggle sessions and restorative mm -hmm. justice sessions and basically kind of grovel in front of a mob. Yeah. Uh, so these are, given Harvard's history uh, of, of those cases and others, to all of us and say, well, you know, genocide, it's just a matter of, you know, I, I disagree with what you say, but I defend to the death your right to say it, right. came off as a little bit, you know, hollow and hypocritical. Yeah. And if Harvard had had a free speech policy that was reasonably um, uh, enforced before that, then at least she would have had something of a leg to stand on and right. standing on principle. And she was technically correct in the same sense that, in the same way that there's no law in the United States that says you can't call for, for, for a Holocaust. Right. Um, it's protected by, hate speech is protected by the First Amendment. Right. But when it's so selectively uh, prosecuted, yeah. then it, 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 it becomes ludicrous and literally becomes a national joke or a national disgrace. And it's worse still that Elise Stefanik, right, the congresswoman leading the hearing, was a, herself a Harvard grad. Well, Although I guess it would have been worse if she was from Yale or Princeton, right? right. That would be. Well, there is some... Uh, uh, th there's some, some some theories that there's a little bit of a revenge motivation there, um, because of an incident in which she was, I think, herself target of a disinvitation oh, and, uh, at yeah. the at the Kennedy School of Government. But there I, was there was a history. It's it's wonderful when you find out that you know all big events in human history are really petty uh, you know, <laughs> jealousy, right? Or get back. So another th one of your points is view viewpoint diversity. Um, what does that consist of? Because, you know, on a, on a certain level, one would assume, and at the better universities, that like, okay, well, the best people rise to the top. And, you know, if there's a consensus, you know, is that a reflection of where the best minds are in a, in a field? Well, so uh, academia has rightly resisted external um, uh, control over content, over hiring, over promotion which is good in protecting a university against government propaganda, government hacks. On the other hand, you can get self-contained circles of people kind of conferring prestige on each other in a circle. And, and then you can get um, uh, kind of entrenched orthodoxies, which no one can challenge, because if they do, then they are downgraded in, in judgments of, of quality, which are right. often so subjective. Yeah, if I may, this is uh, on a kind of larger level. Um, John Dos Passos, uh, the American novelist, was considered by international modernists one of the greatest writers, you know, alive. And then he had the misfortune of going to the Spanish Civil War and deciding that the loyalists were actually kind of as bad as the Francoists. And overnight, literally, his you know, he became a terrible writer, like aesthetically <laughs> yeah. and whatnot. So this yeah. kind of stuff happens, right? No, this stuff happens. And uh, I mean, the uh, if you just define viewpoint by the conventional left-right political spectrum, then things look pretty grim because according to at least a survey of the, the Crimson now, 3% of Harvard faculty identify themselves as conservative. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like four-tenths of 1% as very conservative. I looked I, I at think, that, I, yeah, I, which, right. I wonder who those are. And those three percent are a lot of them are like in their nineties, <laughs> so we kind of know where that's going. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it's not just the left-right spectrum, but right. there can be kind of dogmas that become entrenched within academic fields. So, for example, our our program of win, women and gender studies, you know, I don't think you could use the word you know chromosome, hormones, sexual selection. That would just be not uh, an idea that is thinkable. Uh, now, how the a question is how do you, given that universities do operate by peer review, peer evaluation, how could you open them up to the kind of viewpoint diversity that is you know, intellectually indispensable? Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it, it's a shame that almost 200 years ago, we still have to recite the arguments from John Stuart Mill about why you should allow, listen to arguments that you disagree with, namely, maybe they're right and you're wrong. You know, unless you're infallible, you really should listen to other viewpoints. Maybe the truth lies somewhere in between. Maybe there's some third position you haven't thought of that would only occur to you if you hear the problems with your own position. And uh, even if you're right, your position is only stronger if you have to defend it against legitimate criticisms. But that is uh, the, the, that case has to be made again 200 years later. The question is, how do you um, uh, rescue 
programs, universities, departments, fields that become kind of self-referential echo chambers. Uh, John Haidt and Phil Tetlock mm -hmm. and a number of others in an uh, article came out about eight years ago, kind of called for a kind of affirmative action for conservatives. Mm -hmm. Um, as long as they're not Asian, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, we, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we, we can't, we can't have a whole country over there to, you know, <laughs> they can, they can work it. So that would be, you know, it's what kind the, of, I mean, what do you think of that though? It's, I mean, that seems terrible. Like I mean, quotas, right? yeah, yeah. But just as a, as an idea that maybe especially yeah. departments of, you know, well, political science, or as we call it at Harvard government, mm -hmm. maybe it's not such a terrible thing to have right. a couple of conservatives around. Um, and that should actually be an explicit uh, desideratum, right. if not a quota. But also, I think there may be other mechanisms, just opening the process up. So we even have at universities a mechanism that's supposed to do that. There are so-called visiting committees, mm -hmm. where departments every few years are evaluated by Academics from other universities, but also people from, also some you know, donors, trustees, and what they're supposed to do is advise deans on whether the department is going in a wrong direction. Mm -hmm. In practice, they don't have that much influence, and they're often quite cozy with the departments themselves. But if they were more empowered to be alert to intellectual monocultures, mm -hmm. to um, dogmas that have become entrenched, if that was part of their mission, that would be another and less obtrusive way of trying to mix up the ideas. Can I ideas? ask, say in, in psychology, I mean, you you obviously, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know the right word or phrase to say, but you, you believe in evolutionary psychology or evolutionary approaches to psychology. And I suspect there are fewer and fewer Freudians in the psychology department. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily a problem, right? As much as Okay, independent of what we do academically, we're going to enforce a political or ideological hierarchy uh, or monoculture that has really nothing to do with academics. Um, is that yeah, I mean, really the problem that we're talking about more? Yeah, because there, there are, one hopes that as a field makes progress, certain schools of thought become historical, of ho historical interest. They've kind of made their contribution, you don't have to represent, you don't have to have like one Freudian and one yeah. Chomskyan and right. one structuralist and one functionalist. And, uh, but there shouldn't be a, um, a kind of a political litmus test. Mm -hmm. And there, 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 in many departments there really is. And it sometimes it doesn't even have to pertain to the subject matter of the field. It can just be the person's reputation politically. I had, I was a, uh, on a hiring committee for another department at Harvard, not psychology, and there was an excellent candidate uh, who was, uh, by, by any standards, including his own, a political liberal, but he came, had some heterodox positions. He was opposed to affirmative action, for example. And the department chair said, we can't hire him. He's, a, he's an extreme right winger. Extreme right winger, meaning he had right. you know, criticism of affirmative action. Uh, you often think of academia as being at the, the the left pole. You know that at the North Pole is the spot from which all directions are south. Mm -hmm. So the left pole is the hypothetical position from which all directions are right. Yeah, <laughs> um, and that's the the final uh, principle that you talked about, or the five, final point was DEI disempowerment. Um, how does that happen? I mean, building off of the, that. Why is DEI bad, and then how do you minimize yeah. it? Well, you know, I have nothing against diversity, equity, yeah. and inclusion, but um, you know, as, as Voltaire said about the, the Holy Roman Empire, it was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Yeah. <laughs> and diversity, equity, inclusion is, uh, it imposes an intellectual monoculture. Uh, it, it favors certain groups over others, and it has a long list of offenses that, me that mean you can be excluded. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a a, a strange bureaucracy that it's a culture that that uh, is kind of an independent stratum from the hierarchy of the universities themselves. They the officers get uh, kind of hired or poached or moved laterally from university to university. It's uh, with their own culture, their own their own mores, their own best practices, and it's just not clear who they report to or who supervises them or who allows them to implement policy. And one of the things that the Council on Academic Freedom discovered is that, uh, and we had to dig to do the research that 
a, a notorious practice of the last decade in many universities has been the so-called diversity statements, where job applicants have to submit not only a statement of their uh, research project, their teaching philosophy, but also their commitment to diversity, which in practice means uh, endorsing um, a, a certain set of, a certain canon of beliefs uh, that there's systemic racism, that it's only um, uh, remedy is uh, uh, racial preferences, that the, that racism is is pervasive, that it is the only cause of any disparity in, uh, in in racial proportions. So if someone in their diversity statement says, I believe that the most defensible policy is you know, colorblindness and that the reason for racial um, uh, inequities in universities is because of our educational system in high school, their uh, application would, would would go into the the, the circular file. How did how did that um, how did that come to be? Well, because... this is this is a good question. Yeah. That is a question we've asked ourselves. Yeah. First of all, no one knew that it was a policy of the Harvard yeah. uh, Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Fortunately, unlike some universities, like the University of California, where they are taken seriously, they are vetted by uh, DEI bureaucrats before they're even sent to departments, and they the um, ones that don't um, uh, endorse what we could call a, a kind of woke ideology are just filtered out, wow. which of course- You mean applications go there first before they go to the department? Yes, not at Harvard, but yeah. it, at, at many at universities. UC. But the, uh, no one knew that we had this requirement. No one knew who implemented it. Hmm. That is, the faculty never voted on it. There was not, the president never said, this is our policy going forward. A, a dean of uh, arts and sciences must have signed off on it but no one can remember who or when, but we just you know, live with it. And likewise, freshman orientation that consists of uh, indoctrination sessions, um, somehow, and I think this is emblematic of a trend in universities, that this, um, th this nomenclatura just got empowered and no one knows exactly how. I think what often happens is a dean gets into trouble because of some racial incident, so they hire a bunch of staff, and that's their way of getting out of the trouble, and then they're there forever. Mm. Um, and there's only one way that they've been growing and that's, yeah. uh, or changing, and that's uh, upward. So one of the, the points in the five-point plan is not to necessarily abolish them, although Florida, the Florida mm -hmm. university system has done that, but at least to, you know, just as the military is under civilian control, the DEI bureaucracy mm. should be under the control of responsible... Um, uh, deans, and by which I mean real deans, right. not... So uh, would that mean uh, they should be under the uh, supervision or discretion of faculty, ultimately? Well, f uh, yeah, faculty or at least academic deans like the Dean of Arts and Sciences, right. at least, and the policy should be exposed to the light of day, and the ones that are defensible should be kept, and the ones that aren't should be abolished, but they shouldn't, they shouldn't change the entire university um, hmm. Structure by stealth, which is what ha what has happened with the with the Harvard admissions policies that were you know got into trouble with the Supreme Court. Is part of that uh, part of the problem was that they were lying about it, right? They were saying we weren't penalizing Asian students. Would you have if if Harvard had been more open about it and said, you know what, we want a different student body than the one that our current admissions process is giving? You know, would you be okay with that, or like, how would you? How would well, you? I think if it was like transparent that? and defensible, again, it's 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 odd how many policies at a university um, just got entrenched and no one ever kind of decided on them, defended them against criticism. But the so-called holistic admissions, mm -hmm. it, which is a kind of eye of newt, wing of bat, mystical process right. where they won't say exactly how they do it because it's holistic. Yeah. Uh, but um, which favors you know, some mix of um, regional diversity, which is okay. It's certainly class diversity, I think, is, is, is a good thing. Uh, racial diversity is, was okay if it was for diversity, but not for rectifying injustices. But also uh, activism and uh, arts and athletics and, and volunteer work and cultural experiences uh, which also provided a fig leaf where 
you know, in practice, as we now know from these documents, uh, Harvard could make sure it didn't get too Asian. Right. Uh, I mean, it, de facto, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And it, we know that in the uh, elite schools in the UC system, they have gotten um, uh, you know, largely Asian because right. they're more meritocratic. Right. doesn't seem to have done them tremendous harm. But Harvard did not want that to happen. And so the Asian applicants, as with the Jewish applicants uh, 75 mm -hmm. years before, just mis just happened to be lower in you know, leadership and right. creativity, all these things that you can't measure. Right. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that Florida has banned DEI statements and things like that. How do you feel? And I, I guess that affects uh, state-supported institutions or state-assisted uh, colleges. How do you feel about that in the sense of, you know, I mean, if a, if a state, you know, supports a school, it's going to have some kind of state, but isn't that kind of, from an academic freedom point of view, this is, can be troubling, right? If the state yeah. legislature starts saying, well, you can't do this, you can't do this, you really shouldn't teach that, which Florida is also yeah. trying no, that to is, do. No, that, and that, that is another, uh, another kind of menace. The, you know, I, I do think that it's not unreasonable for the taxpayers to have some kind of input into what it is they're supporting, but uh, and what is the best institutional arrangement where there can be input, there can be safeguards against um, kind of self-serving uh, insular communities without it being managed by political ideologues. Mm -hmm. It's a question of institutional design that I don't even know we have the optimal design for yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, I, I don't think it's unreasonable. And here I differ with some of my faculty colleagues who almost define academic freedom as professorial uh, privilege, professorial prerogatives. Professors should be able to do anything they want and it's no one else's business. Right. You know, I don't think that's right, but you also don't want, as with the McCarthy era, mm -hmm. uh, politically motivated um, ideological restrictions or, 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 or loyalty tests to be imposed by the government. But the government does have a legitimate interest in making sure universities don't go off the rails. Um, over the past, uh, to shift uh, topics a little bit, over the past dozen years or so in books such as The Better Angels of Our Nature, which came out in 2011, and Enlightenment Now in 2018, you've emerged as a chronicler of moral and material progress. Um, and I recommend everyone here uh, in preparing for this, watch the 2015 Monk debate, uh, the Canadian uh, debate, which I guess that's nice for you, right, as a Canadian, to go back and yeah. eke out a victory, but it's where... Uh, Matt Ridley, uh, the rational optimist author, and Steve were uh, saying that, what, it was that uh, human humankind's best years are ahead of it, and you eked out a victory over Malcolm Gladwell and the uh, Swiss uh, philosopher Alain de Bottom, and then a more recent Institute of Art and Ideas debate with John Mearsheimer on w whether enlightenment is a good idea or not. These are... Um, you know, can you summarize your case for progress? I suspect yeah. most of the people in this room are kind of like, obviously it's better now than it was 50 or 100 years ago. But what's, what's the case for progress? Uh, the case is that if you uh, list what you consider dimensions of human well-being, um, that is, we're better off if we are alive than dead, if our babies don't die, if women don't die in childbirth, if people don't live in extreme poverty, if we're safe from violent crime, if we're not at war, if our environments are, are uh, clean, if um, people aren't discriminated against on the basis of their, 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 their race or sex, if children aren't beaten, uh, that is listed. You're really think, taking all the good stuff out of life. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's like, what else is there? Yes, so if you uh, kind of list some reasonable things that people tend to agree are, are, are good things. You know, it's better not to have a famine, better to be well-fed. And then you uh, look at the, the best quantitative estimates over time. Yet as you plot the trends, most, almost all of them get better. Not all, but and that, you know, that would be a miracle. And they don't get better everywhere all the time. It's not as the trends are not, um, as we say, monotonic. That is, the bad things don't always go down and the good things don't always go up. There are often lurches and, and, and shocks. But in pretty much all of them, the historical trend has been yeah. things are getting better. Do you have a theory of social change? Of like, why, why have things gotten better? Yeah, I think it's that as... Um, uh, as uh, 
knowledge increases, and as the kind of arena of debate, discussion, power, deliberation expands, there are just certain things that have to fall by the wayside. So you just can't... Uh, you, uh, barbaric practices of antiquity, like human sacrifice, uh, you throw a virgin into a volcano to get better weather. You know, sooner or later you discover... And if you don't, you realize, well, she wasn't a virgin. <laughs> right? yeah. Obviously. Uh, you know, sooner or later you discover that's the wrong theory, yeah. that actually does, does not, in fact, prevent crop failures or... Um, so there's just superstition that get, if that is if the conditions are in place that knowledge increases, right. um, or that certain races are fit for slavery, um, you know that's just empirically incorrect. Uh, that you know that, that that women are not capable of intellectual work, but are you know, designed just for, for 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 the home. You know, again, the, these are all my factual. favorite example of that was uh, I am 60. I was born in 1963, and up until the late 70s, uh, when I, I graduated high school in 81, and girls were not allowed to pole vault because <laughs> evolution had decreed that they didn't have the upper body strength to pole vault. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, and it seems like evolution has caught up since then. <laughs> right. we'll put that type of as thing. an example, right? Exactly. So there's just the sheer um, gain of knowledge. I think Vol Voltaire, the way he put it, those, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Mm -hmm. um, and just if you you understand how the world works, then I, then uh, and also because there's some things that you know really people do want. They want to be well fed as opposed to hungry and um, healthy as opposed to sick. When Technology provides them with a means, you know, not uniformly because there are there is superstition, but you know, in general, more people yeah. get vaccinated than don't. Do but you... that's not the only thing. Let me just okay, mention yeah. one other idea, which is that um, as you kind of uh, as it's harder for small elites to wield absolute power, as you open up the discussion, then there are certain ideas that just aren't going to to to, to fly. I mean, you just can't um, defend ap apartheid. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, without seeming you know, ridiculous or, or monstrous. You can't defend slavery, um, Jim Crow laws. Uh, when, the, uh, when, when the world's nations came together in the late 40s to agree on a universal declaration of human rights, the question is, is there some common denominator that all of the world's countries, you know, Muslim and, and, uh, uh, and China and, and India and... Uh, the Western countries could all agree on, or would it kind of contract to the null set, uh, as uh, many people suspected? Well, it turned out, you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there's a lot of stuff in there, and, you know, most of it isn't particularly controversial, like everyone should have an education, everyone should, people shouldn't be imprisoned for their political beliefs. Now, if they had started out with the, 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 the drafters with something like, well, the first thing in the Universal Declaration is that you know America is a shining city upon a hill. Well, you probably wouldn't have gotten agreement on that. Right. Or Jesus Christ is our Savior, and that is the way to to, to redemption. You know, again, then the you know the, the Hindus would 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 drop out, and the, the Chinese. So what's left? Well, what's left is the conditions of human flourishing. That is the list of things that I mentioned. That you know, it isn't flamingly controversial to say that it's better to be healthy than sick, yeah. or better for kids not to die, and that. Give, so I think that realization tends to be what survives when the more parochial ideologies become untenable as the kind of circle of discourse broadens. Do you think that um, kind of material progress and moral progress follow? the same logic or, you know, when, when a new technology comes along that, say, you know, uh, increases crop yields or makes, uh, you know, uh, some kind of medicine that keeps people from dying, um, that, does that, the adoption of that follow the same kind of process by which moral progress happens? Or how, are they independent of one another or do they drag each other along? You know, it's interesting. I think they are related. This is something that I uh, kind of in looking at cross-national and cross-temporal um, uh, comparisons in, in putting together the data that went into Enlightenment now, um, I was kind of surprised at how many good things come from being rich uh, for countries. Yeah. That is that you know, people point to you know, Sweden and Denmark and Norway as really nice places to live, and you can invoke their egalitarian ethos. And, but you know, the, these are rich countries. 
Right. And there, if you look at the uh, plot, almost any good thing uh, that is you know, peace, safety, environmental quality against GDP per capita, it, most of the countries fall on a line with the exception of the um, Gulf oil states, which are rich but kind of wretched places. Right. Um, and it may be that you know, an idea is that wealth is, wealth is good just because it buys good stuff, like, you know, like, like health care. Uh, like uh, you know, environmental protection, which is a luxury that you can afford after you have you know, electricity and running water and roads and, 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 and such. Um, and education, I mean, education is expensive. Good policing is expensive. So being rich buys you preconditions for a good life. But there's also, the, so you know, how, why isn't you know, Saudi Arabia such a great place? They've got you know, no, short, no shortage of money. There's an idea that I think should be congenial to many people in this room, in, which is that when you have networks of exchange and commerce and markets, as a, and that's the way you get rich, as opposed to digging stuff out of the ground, which can be monopolized by, by an elite and then fought over. But if, it's, if the wealth comes from distributed networks of commerce and ex voluntary exchange, that kind of pushes people toward cooperation mm -hmm. Um, it's the it's a, a old enlightenment idea of du commerce, gentle commerce, mm. uh, that uh, the American founders endorsed, and and uh, Immanuel Kant and uh, Voltaire and and others. That if you, for one thing, if you're in a trading relationship, that gives you it, it yokes your well-being to that of other people. Mm. So you know you don't kill your customers, you don't kill your your you don't kill your debtors, mm. and if it becomes cheaper to buy stuff than to steal it then uh, that eliminates one of the incentives for conquest and plunder. Hmm. And so countries that, 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 get afflu that are both affluent and get their affluence hmm. from networks of exchange tend to be pleasant in, in other yeah, ways. They tend to be more liberal in the and they tend classical to more, sense, right? Yeah. In, in the classical and in the, well, and in the uh, kind of American political sense in that they have more munificent welfare states. Hmm. So as yeah. countries get richer, they get more redistrib redistributive. That's another. Uh, All right. That's yeah. Maybe that's less congenial. Yeah, less, less congenial, congenial here, here. But it's an it's, interesting uh, kind of. It's sometimes called it's called uh, I've heard it called Wagner's law, okay. uh, and that um, so rich country the, the the countries that that people on the left tend to extol right. because of their welfare states also have a lot of economic freedom and also are yeah. very affluent. Yeah, that came up when Bernie Sanders was pointing to places like Norway and Sweden, which actually do better, or at least sometimes do better on economic yeah. freedom indexes than the U.S. Yeah, so, yeah that's right. Yeah, yes. there's a lot of kind of bullshit on both sides of that debate. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, what um, what do you think explains, and I realize this would cover a vast range of people, but the people who deny progress, moral or material, like what's in it for that? What's in it for them to be like, no, you know what, actually, we're no better off than we were 100 or 200 years ago, or there has not been any significant progress uh, when it comes to things like race, class, gender, sexual orientation over, say, the past 20 or 50 years? Yeah, I think you know, it's a, a, a question I've thought about a lot. Why, you know, so why, why do progressives hate progress, for example? Um, <laughs> The uh, and it is you know I have to say that in the uh, in the various political factions and and um, bands along the spectrum it is it does tend to be libertarians who are most congenial to the idea of progress that wasn't always true right. that 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 that's kind of what what I found um, I, I think one reason is that uh, I think the Hobbes put it put it well because it's, it's a long standing phenomenon because we're talking about I'm giving you a quote that's almost four hundred yeah. years old let's see if I can remember it. Uh, Verbatim, competition of praise inclineth to a reverence for antiquity, for men contend with the living, not with the dead. Mm. That is, to criticize the present is a way of criticizing your rivals, your, your competitors. Um, and uh, so if, you, if there's something that you don't like about the status quo, you want to say how much everything sucks. You don't want to say how much better everything is than it used to be because then you might be giving credit to the people that you're contending with. Yeah. So that, that's, a, that's a big one. Yeah. There are also, I think, cognitive biases that hide progress from us. 
such as the um, the availability bias, as coined by uh, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, which is that we tend to judge probability, risk, danger, according to how easily anecdotes uh, come to mind. That is, we use our, uh, our, our brain search engine as a, a surrogate for, for probability. And so if there is a disaster, uh, a terrorist attack, a police shooting, a, uh, a famine in a part of the world, that's our answer to the question, are things getting better or worse? Well, of course they're getting worse, uh, I just remember. I just read about the, the terrorist attack this morning, and that sticks in memory. Um, also, there's a, a, an emotional coloring to memory that even though we remember bad uh, events in the past, we don't remember how bad they were at the time. Mm -hmm. So that the negative affect tends to wear off of memory, whereas the negative aspects of the present are still keenly felt. And uh, again, this is not a new phenomenon. I'd like to quote Franklin Pierce Adams, that nothing is more responsible for the good old days than a bad memory. Yeah. And that is really true. And, and uh, you know, even, and in, in our lifetimes, uh, even though there are people, especially younger people, who kind of moan about how this is an unprecedented hellscape, but um, you know, in the 70s, the world had only 33 democracies, mm. that you know, half of Europe was behind the Iron Curtain. Spain and Portugal were literally fascist dictatorships, not just countries that people called fascist, but they called themselves fascist. You know, G Greece was under the control of a military junta, all of Latin America. So democracy, despite the recent recession, people forget how undemocratic the world was in the lifetime of, of many people. And uh, just quality of life, like if you missed a movie in the local repertory theater, if you didn't live in a big city that had a repertory theater, you would never see you know, film classics, you couldn't um, uh, get access to musical performances, um, you, uh, you, you, you got lost because you didn't have Google Maps, uh, you couldn't look something up in, in Wikipedia, you had to go to the, this thing called the you know, Britannica, uh, and all of these ways that our lives really have gotten better are very easily uh, yeah, we omitted. take them for granted very quickly. We take them right. for granted. But I think the biggest thing, at least among intellectuals, is competition among elites. Yeah. The... Um, before we go to uh, uh, audience questions, um, you are in town partly uh, because your photography is being shown at Brooklyn Sweet Lorraine Gallery, and your exhibition is called Two and a Half D, The Stereoscopic Photography of Steven Pinker, which sounds like a concept album from the late 60s, <laughs> right? It's yeah. like, um, can you explain what stereoscopic photography is and does your interest in photography, and you're quite accomplished at it, does it tie into your larger intellectual interests? Yeah, it, 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 uh, it does, and uh, it actually goes back to my PhD thesis, and my PhD thesis advisor is actually in, in the room, Stephen Coslin where um, the topic was uh, the mental do you, representation. Do you feel judged or? Uh, yes, yeah, I'm, uh, okay. especially yeah. at the Q&A. The Q yeah, <laughs> uh, okay, well, we'll we just wire him in, first. In the store, yeah. yes. Okay. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the, 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 the term two and a half D uh, was borrowed from artificial intelligence, the artificial intelligence of 40 years ago, in particular a researcher named David Marr, who proposed that that is what the uh, that is the information that the eyes give to the brain. That is, we don't literally see the world in three dimensions because we see in perspective, uh, both when we are physically observing a scene, you stand between two railroad tracks, you kind of see them as parallel, you know that they're parallel, but you also see them converge, you see them in perspective. Uh, and as things uh, uh, recede in distance, you can sense they get smaller even though you know that they're the, the same size. So that's not what you'd get from a, a, an actual three-dimensional uh, model of the world, a kind of uh, uh, mental sandbox, uh, but it, nor is the world flat as a pancake. Mm -hmm. So t the two and a half dimensions alludes to the fact that the third dimension is not like the other two. It's actually mm -hmm. computed from a number of visual sources of visual information. Uh, when lines converge toward the horizon, we interpret that as depth. When uh, things 
uh, certain things move in the visual field faster than others. We interpret that gradient of motion as a cue to depth. But the most, I think, the most one of the most interesting is the difference in the view that the two eyeballs give you. That each eyeball is a different vantage point on the world. The views are slightly different, and the farther away something is, the, the closer its images are in the two eyeballs. The closer it is, the more they diverge. It's kind of a high school trigonometry problem to triangulate from the distance between the eyes, the angle, and the differences in the images to how far away something is. Um, the brain does that trig unconsciously, and it gives us a very vivid sense of the third dimension. Now, the photography comes from, uh, it's almost as old as photography itself, that in the 19th century, most photography was stereo photography, which means showing two images taken from two vantage points separated by approximately the distance of the eyes and figuring out a technological way of getting each image uh, to be seen only by one eye. And that can be done with prisms, that can be done with mirrors, that can be done with false color. And in the recent technology, which is one of the uh, kind of inspirations for this show, kind of when I, sh I showed it to the gallery owner, it just blew, blew him away, a new kind of monitor that gives you a stereoscopic image without any headgear without any glasses, without any gimmicks. It's really stunning, actually. It just pops yeah. out, yeah, yeah, through some some, some optical uh, wizardry. And, and so I used it to, I, I have ultra close-up photos of flowers, mm -hmm. which kind of reveal their shape and color in um, kind of hyper-natural detail. It's uh, really stunning stuff, so go to the Sweet Lorraine Gallery. How, lo how long is it around for? Until uh, the end of March. Okay. Um, are you an AI uh, optimist or pessimist, or is that just a silly question? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, in principle, I'm an AI optimist. You never know how you know, technologies will be implemented. I'm not an AI doomer. I don't, do not think that AI will uh, enslave us or turn us into raw materials. Mm. Uh, the, the scenario sometimes called the paper clip ellipse. Yeah. Uh, that is the scenario in which uh, an artificial intelligence system is given a goal of uh, maximizing manufacturing of some commodity like paper clips mm -hmm. and uses every available resource, including our own bodies, to make more and more and more paper clips. So that does not keep me up at night. Yeah. Um, there are dangers like um, uh, impersonation, mm -hmm. uh, counterfeit people, uh, spread of disinformation, erosion of uh, kind of the, the, the uh, uh, chain of verification of fact. Mm. Um, there's the hypothetical of technological unemployment, although mm. we're still waiting for that yeah. to happen. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think there's tremendous promise. It's kind of a shame that the first large-scale implementation of AI was kind of a gimmick of a first-person chatbot. Mm which may have some advantages and may have some misuses. Right. But there are the tremendous promise for, uh, for AI if it's task-oriented, like, um, well, uh, autonomous vehicles that mm. could cut down of the um, million people killed every year in car crashes, of eliminating jobs that no one particularly likes that are repetitive and so dangerous like and boring. DEI uh, <laughs> enforcement, right? Yeah, That's, that could that be the first be, yeah. Actually... Seriously, uh, one of my postdocs uh, who was on the job market and she um, had to write a DEI statement but couldn't do it in good conscience, so she had ChatGPT write wow. it for her. Wow. It's actually pretty good. Did she get, pretty a, convincing. Yeah, get offers? or uh, well, she's, it's, well, it's still happening. Okay. But, uh, yeah. Well, why don't we uh, open it up for uh, audience questions? Uh, let's start with uh, Jonathan. No. Oh, okay. So, so I wanted to ask a question about intellectual influences. You mentioned your thesis advisor who's here tonight. We recently lost John Tooby, who yeah. I know you were a long colleague with. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about some of your intellectual influences, specifically those two people. And But before I let you answer, I want to say thank you for your adverbs, which make me laugh in private. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, yeah, so several several streams. Uh, John Tooby was a dear friend and a major intellectual influence, together with his um, co-author and wife, Lita Cosmides. That intellectual tradition from evolutionary biology of George Williams, John Maynard Smith, uh, Richard Dawkins, 
uh, William Hamilton was a, an influence. The, um, uh, the, the intellectual founders of cognitive science from the 1950s of um, uh, uh, Al Newell and Herbert Simon, uh, Noam Chomsky, uh, Marvin Minsky, Jerry Fodor, um, uh, and the philosophers that were kind of partners of them, Hilary Putnam and, and uh, uh, later Dan Dennett. Um, the, going back further, I think the, the Enlightenment tradition of David Hume, Thomas Hobbes, um, Spinoza, um, John Stuart Mill, a, a little, little bit later. Um, the, uh, let's see, um, Thomas Sowell of Among Living, um, what what do you like about Sol? And I know you share the interest in photography with yes, him, and which you've it, talked about that. But. They, we were both uh, f uh, you know, ca camera nerds. Yeah. Um, we met over an interest in language because he had written, he's written actually two books. I mean, he's written a, a, a superhuman number of books, but mm -hmm. two of them were on late-talking children, and, be and he actually contacted me because of my long-standing research program in child language because he, his own son was a late-talker but not autistic, not retarded, not deaf. And there is a syndrome of uh, uh, kids who are late in talking, uh, are good in comprehension, often seem to be uh, bal imbalanced in the other direction of having high uh, spatial, uh, visual spatial uh, skills. So that, that kind of got us together and that led me to his, uh, a lot of intellectual history, including of, of a lovely book called *The Conflict of Visions*, which tried to answer the question. Now, it might be coming up obsolete, but why do the the ideologies that we associate with the left and the right hang together? In the sense that, if you know someone's position on, say, gun control, why can you predict their position on um, economic redistribution or a strong military? Uh, or a flag burning amendment or something. Or, like that. Yeah. yeah, so many things seem to cluster together that superficially have nothing in common. Um, he argued that they come from different visions of human nature, namely whether there is such a thing as human nature, which is fundamentally uh, limited and flawed and which therefore consigns us to certain inherent tragedies that um, we, we can't have perfect peace and cooperation. Uh, therefore, we do need military and police. You can't have uh, a, a designed economic system because no one's smart enough to do it. So you need just the distributed information in a in a in markets. Would you, would you consider yourself a kind of an anti-utopian in that sense? Yeah, in exactly. Because that thinking sense. of Hobbes and even people like Stuart Mill, who's more in between. But yeah, I'm I'm a, a ameliorist in that I think things can get better, but uh, I think a, a, aspiring to utopia is is dangerous uh, for reasons that. Uh, Isaiah Berlin pointed out, namely that there are just inherent trade-offs, and if you maximize one thing, you're going to uh, uh, one criterion, you're going to have awful trade-offs in, in in others. But another thing that that, that Tom Sowell has inspired me with is his, the, his analysis of ethnic groups of, and the history of ethnic groups of how so often the fortunes of groups depend on their own will depend on their deep history their ecology. He anticipated a lot of the ideas of uh, Jared Diamond before mm -hmm. Diamond published uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel. And he also has, I think, one of the most interesting theories of anti-Semitism. Uh, which is? Which is that um, Jews, like other minorities that have been reviled and sometimes massacred, uh, Armenians in Turkey, uh, Indians in Africa, uh, uh, Chinese in Southeast Asia, um, often are middlemen minorities. They spe specialize in the niches of retail and money lending, both of which uh, violate our intuitive cognitive economics. The, the natural way that people think of economic activity is kind of barter, equal for equal. Um, but then you have the money lenders where they lend out money and they don't just want it back, but they want it back with something extra, which kind of feels like theft or exploitation or parasitism. Likewise, a retailer uh, doesn't cause stuff to come into being. He's not a farmer, he's not a craftsman, um, but just takes stuff and then uh, gives it to someone else asking for some extra money. Right. Uh, so even though uh, in terms of economics, this is indispensable, this is where wealth comes from, is the ability to move 
uh, goods in time and in space, mm -hmm. which is why all economies depend on both retail and money lending. But if they're so cognitively unintuitive that they're interpreted as exploitation and parasitism, then these minorities will be targets of, of uh, hatred for being exploiters. And he, also, he argues that there are other parts of this niche that tend to co-occur. They tend to be um, uh, uh, cohesive because they depend on um, uh, their own internal networks of trust, uh, at least in the absence of a robust system of, of contracts. They depend on reputation. They depend on kids um, kind of replicating their set of values and mores. Um, and this whole cluster explains why other ethnic groups have often been informally called the Jews of India, the Jews of China, the Jews of, of, of such and such, and these Jews of whatever also tend to be targets of, of hatred. Uh, next question. Sorry. Hi. Um, so I read an article 25 or 30 years ago in the New Yorker about admissions to um, to elite universities, and it talked about how the um, the athletic admissions was one of the criteria that was introduced to reduce the proportion of Jews. A athletic, did you say? Yeah. Yes, I, I, right, there's a book by Ger Jeremy Carabell that kind of exposed and, that. Uh, and and this article, um, one of my takeaways from it was that. In the end, they discovered that these hyper-competitive kids who they had allowed in under um, sporting scholarships as opposed to academic merit actually ended up being amongst the highest performing graduates in the university because they had this other trait that they hadn't been looking for but had um, unintentionally um, improved the, um, the outcomes for their students. And the argument was, in some ways, the most intelligent response to life isn't necessarily to um, throw your personal um, quality of life away to, com to be uh, uber compar competitive. Um, but it was introduced as a, one of the many stealth ways of ensuring that Jews didn't overtake the higher, um, higher institutions. Is this current um, movement any different from from that? And is there any potential for an upside? Uh, any potential for? An upside, in that you would uncover um, competitive, high-performing kids yeah, through a different I don't, mechanism. Certainly, uh, you know, there, 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 is a tr there are traits of conscientiousness, ambition, taking your career trajectory seriously that probably manifest themselves in not just academic achievement, but you also, you know, play the violin, and you also play sports, and you also sort clothes for the homeless, and you also uh, uh, have, have your neighbor sign a petition, um, especially if it, it is common knowledge that the admission system selects for that, then the savvier students or the ones with savvier parents or both will kind of optimize everything that needs to be optimized. Uh, but I think it is... Uh, I think it's it's wasteful. I think it probably doesn't optimize for um, the, the the students that we that are best matched for the resources that an elite university has to offer. Whereas I think looking at test scores would um, not only be fairer in the sense that it's hard, they're harder, much harder to game. The test prep does not add that; it adds very little. Um, if, uh, all the other criteria can be gamed. They're all class. All of the others are uh, enhanced by class. Having parents in practice, mothers who know how to how to game the system, um, tutors for writing the personal statements, uh, and as it happens, the data suggests that if you select on test scores, you also get a lot of musical talent and entrepreneurial energy and you know, novelists and playwrights and company starters together with the academic nerds. So I think well, you're right that there is a massive intercorrelation among all these positive traits, but it'd probably be more straightforward to select for the one that's most relevant to an elite university. Uh, so you're against football schools. That's what I'm hearing from that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm against... I, and is that because you're Jewish? Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> come on. All right. Let, I well, mean, let, yeah. I, a surprising number of Harvard students are admitted yeah. on, on athletic uh, scholarships. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and often for like kind of more 
uh, rare. Fencing. Right? Yeah, fencing. Yes, right. made so many fencers, who knew, right? Yeah. Uh, next question. Um, so you mentioned a number of indicators that um, are basically, on, in aggregate, the general human goodness index of the world. And knowing those indicators, and you gave a truncated list, are there some that are leading indicators or some that could yeah. be causal to improve society going forward? And is there a path to our leaders taking into consideration those leading indicators and those causal metrics um, to design policy going forward? And if that's difficult, then we can create a general academic goodness index and use the same for mm -hmm. universities and have their oh, leadership yeah. decide on these KPIs ahead of time and then govern based on them? Or are we too far away? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's um, there, there are some arguments that education is a leading indicator, that countries that kind of invest in um, primary and secondary education uh, have downstream benefits in, say, GDP per capita and, and uh, democracy. But like a lot of social science, so many things are correlated with so many other things that, um, and then you get like one regression expert who does the analysis that shows that this is the, of all the confounded factors, this is the leading indicator, and then someone else says, no, you did the regression wrong. Um, but I think it's, it's it, I, I agree that it is a question that we ought to find the answer to, uh, but, but, but very difficult. For the university, it's harder because the, uh, you know, what are the criteria if it's just prestige, the thing is that prestige is kind of a self-levitating bubble. Uh, how do you judge prestige? Well, the university's presidents rate each other on prestige. You, know, you could do it in terms of, I don't know, patents, Nobel Prizes, you know, Pulitzer Prizes, whatever. Um, and then it would, I don't know, uh, the fact that I don't know that it's been done doesn't mean it hasn't been done, but I don't know if it's been done. That is, could you predict what makes a university better other than the obvious thing of money? Uh, you know, 10 or 20 years down the line, depending on what they invest in uh, at the beginning of the period. But it's a great question. Uh, we've got time for two more questions. So uh, next question. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, and, and thanks for your work. I really enjoy it. Uh, before your work, the most ardent proponent of reason and enlightenment values was Ayn Rand. So I wonder what's your favorite or least favorite of her works? All of them is an acceptable answer <laughs> yeah. for, for either side. Yeah, I hope I, hope I get, don't get canceled, but... Um, <laughs> in you this don't want to be canceled by objectivists. No, no. <laughs> I, you know, I, I can't say that, I, that, that she's been an, an influence. Um, certainly the... And, and as my libertarian friends emphasize, uh, objectivism and libertarianism aren't the same thing. And uh, you know, I think Ayn Rand's own influence, although she tried to erase it, was uh, in, in, in some part Nietzsche rather than the Enlightenment, although of course there, there is Enlightenment thinking in her, in her ideas. But the idea of the, the, the heroic you know, industrialist fi financier combined with a bit of uh, indifference to the the the, 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 the schlemiels that make up the majority of society was kind of Nietzschean and a historian, Jennifer Burns, I think it is, who wrote the, that biography of her, right. noted that in her, her early drafts, there were epigraphs from Nietzsche, which she then erased. Um, so that's, and I, in Enlightenment now, I kind of have some fun at the expense of, of Nietzsche uh, as kind of the answer to the question, what's the opposite of humanism and enlightenment thinking? And it would have to be Nietzsche with his deification of the heroic um, uh, martial, or martial warrior or artistic genius mm -hmm. and kind of contempt for the well-being of all of humanity. Um, but now that's, um, so uh, you know, Ayn Rand is not, I would not say one of my influences, although I have uh, uh, kind of s syncretic world uh, worldview that does have certain strong libertarian influences, um, although I'm not, uh, there, there are ways in which I systematically depart from libertarianism as well. Who or who is one of the libertarian influences? Well, t Tom Sowell himself, no. okay. certainly, um, and um, uh, Hayek, mm -hmm. who also, together with his uh, analysis of the 
intelligence that's distributed in um, markets and the fact that the reason that markets function is that information, uh, local information can be propagated. But he was also an amateur uh, uh, neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. He had a theory that the brain accomplished its intelligence also by densely interconnected networks of information exchange. Uh, this is back, I think, in the early 50s or, right. or 40s. Um, but, um, and, and uh, uh, Hayek's um, um, noting of uh, inherent trade-offs, mm -hmm. which I think influenced uh, Tom so, Sowell, yeah. that you can't have both perfect equality and perfect freedom. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I would count that as a major influence. Yeah. Um, last question. So, sorry. So my guess is that everyone here, by and large, probably fits under the heterodoxical orientation, which is basically homogeneous. So my question is, <laughs> how how do we engage, and not just sort of on the margins, but in a broad way? How do people who take the heterodoxical, which again is kind of like enlightenment thinking, how do we apply that and how do we engage broader with the left, with the right, with those who don't take this orientation so that we're not just talking to ourselves and a few people who are willing to listen? Yeah, good. I mean, an important kind of strategic, tactical, practical question. Um, it, uh, I mean, it, some of it would be to forge strategic uh, alliances on issues that different subsets have in common, uh, to have a kind of patchwork coalition based on what ideas are important to which constituencies and emphasize those. Some of it to uh, remind people of the fact that, these, that many of these principles are just ground rules that we all depend on, even if we have a temporary tactical advantage in shutting uh, up the people we disagree with. In the uh, past or potentially in the near future, they could do it to us. So it really is in our advantage, our meaning everyone's advantage to allow free discourse because as soon as you start to constrict it, it could be a weapon that others use against you. Uh, some of it could be to, and to, and to use history lessons to remind people that their own tribe, even though now they may be exploiting it tactical advantage in suppressing uh, opinion that they themselves depended on freedom of speech in earlier eras. So, for example, women's suffrage, um, civil rights, gay rights, abolition, uh, all depended on free speech in the day. All were uh, shut down by the cancel culture in their eras. To kind of say that even if you're uh, kind of an egalitarian leftist, you ought to be in favor of free speech because it the opposite used to be used as a weapon against you guys. So that is a kind of common ground. I will uh, also point out you, I mean, in, in books like Enlightenment Now, you relied on uh, work done by um, uh, the Rose, Rosling, Roser. Oh, Hans, oh, Hans Rosling. Yeah, and, and, uh, and Our World in Data, as well as Human Progress, the site Human Progress. And, you know, facts always need to be interpreted, but documenting things like progress I, I've met a, a few people who've read your books and are like, oh, yeah, I was kind of, when I'm in a fog and I'm just making an argument about how shitty things are, it's one thing. But then when you have to start to account for this and this and this, that is one way of being persuasive and reaching people who don't necessarily agree. Yeah, that's right. And there, there is a, a, a kind of a cynical finding from recent social science that people are unmoved by facts, that they would just... Um, cherry pick or spin doctor any fact to support their their uh, prior narrative. And there, there, there is a lot of that, yeah. but it is too cynical in that um, there are people can be persuaded, uh, you know, unless it is they're absolutely central to their identity, um, they, they can change their mind on the basis of data, particularly when it's presented in graphs, something that I've mm tickled me because I've also interested in, in, in uh, graph perception, another common interest with, uh, with Steve Coslin. that Brendan Nyan, a, a um, political scientist yeah. at Dartmouth, has shown that you give people graphs and they, it makes them harder to deny reality, even though graphs can lie too, of course. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Well, I want to uh, thank uh, Steven Pinker for talking tonight. Please give him a big hand of applause.